It's the final session of the second day of this wonderful event, and I've, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not nervous bec because being on stage in general, but I'm nervous because there's a lot of responsibility tied to this session, because this is like the message uh, we, we are going to send you home with. Um, so we thought a lot about what we are uh, going to tell you. Um, this is a session about uh, web accessibility, obviously. And uh, before we start, I would like to do some housekeeping stuff. Um, first of all, um, I would like to express how grateful I am to uh, have the, the possibility to be here this, these two days. And I think it was a fantastic event. I really enjoyed it a lot, and I guess we all did. Mm -hmm. um, and this is all to the, to the wonderful team that is organizing and running this event. And I would uh, express my gratitude towards uh, Melanie and her team and all the helping hands here, the technical staff and everyone. So I think they deserved a, a big round of applause, right? Mm -hmm. So thanks uh, to the DevRake team. It was really fantastic. Um, I've taken some notes so that I don't forget anything. Uh, as, he, as, as we already heard, this is going to be a Q&A panel, so uh, we are going to have uh, time in the end for you to ask questions, uh, which you hopefully have. We don't really use slides, but we thought about a couple of questions we would like to walk you through, and uh, we just prepared some very simple uh, slides to have the questions up there so that you can uh, see what we're currently talking about. Um, we, we try to have this panel as accessible itself as possible, so we're trying to speak uh, slowly and clearly, but if we don't succeed in this, please uh, interrupt us and let us know, and so we're going to repeat something or speak slower, whatever. We're trying to do that. Um, First of all, uh, we are going to introduce ourselves a little bit for you. Um, I'm going to start with Erin. Erin, who are you and why are you here and what's your connection uh, to web accessibility or yeah. accessibility? Hi, so I'm Erin Doyle and I'm a full, full stack web developer. And I've been working with web accessibility for about five plus years. Uh, the last two jobs I've had, uh, our companies made web accessibility a high priority. So I had to go from zero to 60. I had to learn how to make all of my work accessible, how to test it, and whatnot. And so you know, that's why I'm here to talk about you know, what that's like. Great. Molly, what's your connection to accessibility? Hello, everyone. Um, so my, my name's Molly. Can everyone hear me OK? Hello. Can everyone hear me OK? <laughs> cool. The reason I asked that is because I am deaf, so I needed, I needed to hear you say yes. <laughs> um, I have a disability myself, so I am deaf and I'm also blind, hence my cane folded up. Um, and that is first and foremost why I'm very passionate about accessibility. I've had to use technology for accessibility to earn a living, to, to make friends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the work that I do is all around inclusive design and trying to steer people in the right direction to create fully accessible, inclusive services. Um, and I know Joshi through um, uh, basically accessibility conferences, hasn't it? been um, kind of just, uh, yeah, I'm very good at talking around the subject because it's very close to my heart. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why I'm here today. Great, thank you. And just a few words about me. I'm Yoshi. You heard that. I'm, uh, kind, I'm, I'm always, it's difficult to tell you what I'm actually doing. I, I started as an interior designer doing uh, code and, and design since, I'm coding since I'm 10 years old and I'm doing design all the time. I'm running events and I'm uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'm a certified professional in web accessibility, so I'm doing audits and uh, uh, trying to analyze websites and trying to improve it and doing a lot of consultancy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's enough about me. Let's dive into the first question we've got. We've got, I think, nine or eight, eight or nine questions we want to walk you through, and we're starting with this uh, very basic question, what is web accessibility? I would like to ask you, who of you has ever heard about like, the concepts of web accessibility? Who of you knows what website? OK, keep your hands up, please. So, and that's, that's great. So who of you is like, using web accessibility principles in his daily, their daily work um, and apply that? OK, that's great. 
like half of it maybe. <laughs> and who of you, keep your hands up, and who of you uh, has got a really, has a, an accessibility first mindset? So that, like, that's the basic thing you always do. Okay, so I, at least I see like two or three hands, which is great, so that's nice. Um, well, in the, in the real world, we're talking about web accessibility here, but uh, let's first unpack the term accessibility. In the real world, you obviously know some sort of obstacles. For example, um, when there are stairs, uh, you all know that it's, this is probably going to be a problem for, uh, for example, wheelchair users. Well, and there are similar things in the web. So how does this map to the web? Um, Molly, what do you say? What's web accessibility? So um, I think it's really important to understand, first and foremost, that people with disabilities rely on tech mostly to access everyday you know, things. So whether it be work or day-to-day, -day, booking a train ticket, that involves your apps and websites. So we have a set of tools that we would use to access the web, but in order to access the web, the, the website needs to be designed to be compatible with the tools that are available out there. Um, but that, with that said, we cannot base a, the assumption that every person with uh, an impairment or a disability or whatever have got these tools at home, but they do have access to some kind of mainstream tech, whether it be a phone um, or a laptop. They may not have the tools set in place, but again, your website needs to be built inclusively so that these people can still access, um, just like everybody else, because that's equality. You mentioned uh, people with disabilities, but obviously web accessibility is not only about um, uh, people with uh, disabilities, Erin. Um, who, like who, who else benefits from, from accessible websites? Yeah, really, it's, it's, it's all of us. Uh, pretty much any of us at any given point in time in our lives are, are going to deal with maybe a temporary limitation or an environmental situation. So perhaps I've broken my arm and now I can't use a mouse. Uh, or um, maybe I've, I'm sick and I've taken some medication and my brain is foggy and I have a cognitive impairment. Uh, maybe I'm sitting outside on a sunny day trying to use my, my mobile phone and I can't see it because the color contrast is not enough. Uh, so it's not just people with disabilities. I think a lot of times when we talk about web accessibility, we get stuck on certain groups. We think um, people using screen readers, people who are blind. But really, it's everyone. We're, we're targeting everyone. We are all the users. So we really need to understand how are all of our users uh, approaching our sites? How are they all using the web today, whether it's with these assistive technologies or maybe they're using different strategies. Maybe you know, they're approaching our websites differently. Or, or again, maybe it's just their environment has changed. So, so we need to make sure that no matter how they're coming to our sites, they can use them. OK, you already mentioned some uh, examples for web accessibility. For example, color <laughs> contrast is something that could, be, uh, that could be important. There is another one, by the way. Uh, we moved our chairs to the right because uh, what you see here, the captions we have, this is also uh, some sort of um, accessibility uh, feature that's really important for people who... It, it's going to be even more important when there are recordings, for example, of this uh, talk and uh, the other talks of the conference because uh, so many people who really rely on uh, captions like that one. Do we, do we have some more really practical examples of web accessibility? What do you think? Mm. Just some buzzwords. Some examples yeah. of accessibility. Um, so following on from the caption capability, you can create transcripts on that. Um, so of course, a lot of um, blind people, for instance, I know we're trying to um, but using a transcript, it can be translated for braille display machines, it can be translated into different languages, um, uh, different types of assistive technologies can read transcripts a lot easier than they can live, live, transcri uh, live captions. Um, and I always think, particularly in the past year with COVID, transcription from uh, meetings and things like that have been really useful for people that weren't able to make the meeting in the first place. So you could just pull up a transcription which was ordinarily built for someone with um, 
you know, visual impairment or whatever, but actually that could also be really useful for someone who just missed a meeting. Um, but that is a form of um, accessibility that was built for some people using assistive tools, but is actually useful from an, from an inclusive perspective. Um, <clears throat> just following on from uh, Erin's point there. Okay, you already mentioned a lot of, uh, a lot of numbers, so uh, can we maybe uh, elaborate a, a bit on, on the question why accessibility is important, why should we care? I think this is something you're very uh, enthusiastic <laughs> so about. Besides the fact there is one billion people in the world that are registered with a disability, and there's one in seven people in the UK, so around 20%. It's around 20% everywhere else in Europe as well um, that have a long-term disability. But please note that these are people that have been diagnosed with disabilities, long-term disabilities. What about the people that are awaiting their diagnosis? What about people with arthritis that don't necessarily they don't identify as someone who is disabled? I personally, I'm registered deaf blind, but I would never stand here and say, hi, I'm, I'm a disabled person. It all comes down to the individual. So when we're talking statistics, Yes, okay, one billion people sounds like a big number already, but arguably, when talking about accessibility and who it benefits, the number is even bigger. Um, I, as I mentioned a minute ago, I'm registered blind, so I have five degrees vision left, but the vision I do have left is quite good. So ironically, my parents, who are sighted, and they're in their 50s and they wear glasses, they have their text size on their phone bigger than I have on mine, and I'm blind. Um, and that is just because they've acquired, you know, later on, I think it, when you get to 40, it's one in four people wear glasses. And now glasses are a form, I can see a few pairs of glasses. Glasses are a form of assistive technology because they assist and they help you access content. So therefore, when we're thinking about accessibility, don't narrow it down to just blind people or just, you know, minority groups of people. It's so important that we actually consider the wider picture when thinking about accessibility and kind of tweak your perspective around what accessibility actually means. It doesn't necessarily mean long-term disability. What do you think, Erin? Yeah, and so I, I, I think, of, of course, the number one reason you should care about accessibility is because we should care about our fellow human beings. You know, almost everything is on the web now. Our world is online. There are so many things that you either can't do or it's very difficult to do anywhere but online. You know, you need to fill out a form, it's online. So our world is there. And, and if there is this huge percentage of people who can't do the same things that others of us can and, and who can't complete crucial tasks that they need to do in their lives, that's a big deal and we should care about that. But if that's not enough for your company, it's not, if that's not enough to motivate them to make web accessibility a priority, um, there are some other reasons. Uh, if you work for a company or your web application is um, selling products, then that at least 20%, and it's really a lot more than 20%, they may not be able to purchase your product. So your bottom line is impacted. You're leaving over 20% of your profits on the floor. So companies should care about that. Um, in addition, uh, at least in the U.S., I'm, I'm not familiar with the European laws, but um, there are two bits of um, legislature that it, it's actually, um, you, you can sue a company or an entity if their website is not accessible. Uh, in the U.S., the Internet is seen as equal to public places of accommodation. So it's, it, it's seen as discrimination if a person cannot complete the task or the, the features that your um, web application is providing. They are being discriminated against because they are blocked from having an equal experience as others, just as if they couldn't get into a building. So um, that's another really big deal. There are a lot of lawsuits every year in the US, thousands. So it's, a, it's, it's real, it happens, and, and so companies need to care about that as well. That's true. Um, unfortunately, we can't talk a lot about that because of time reasons, um, but I can't give you a number. There are so many lawsuits in the US that you say it's one every working hour, mm -hmm. so, and the fines are really, really high. And uh, the situation in Europe isn't quite 
quite that way. Uh, we are not that far. The ADA exists like 31 years or something, so there's a long history of uh, this sort of practice in the US. But well, we're going to have something very similar in Europe. Uh, in 2019, uh, uh, something new got signed, that is the European Accessibility Act, and it will be in place until 2025. So in 2025, that will be the first situation when, uh, that's across Europe, by the way, uh, when certain parts of the private industries need to be accessible. For example, banking services need to be accessible, and not only on the web, but also the ATMs and stuff. So there's a lot going on right now. And um, in a couple of years, uh, pretty much no one can can go around the web accessibility topic any longer. So uh, things are moving, and this should motivate like every one of us to uh, do and work accessibly, actually. So um, this is something for the designers. Why is accessible design better design? Um, and uh, who, who actually really benefits from that? So following on from my previous point, um, obviously, like talking about my parents, and they rely on the old large text, which is available on Android and iOS and all other products. You can make your size bigger, which is great for texting, email. But then the amount of apps you then go to install that are not compatible with dynamic type, which is the large text element on um, iOS, is it's, it's just astonishing. Um, so up until only a couple of years ago, I think Facebook and Twitter weren't doing it. And then now, so if you have your, your phone set to large text, when you install an app, what should automatically happen is the app reads that setting, the personalized you know, preference accessibility setting. It automatically makes the text larger. It makes sense because people are relying on large text. And when you think, so if you've gone to the office and you've forgotten your glasses, like what do you do? Do you sit there and you strain or do you actually try and magnify, change some colors? Do you, you know, so it's really following on from the point where I was talking about accessibility and to inclusion. Better design means that more people will be able to access it. And not just us one day, but our parents, our grandparents. You know, I used to work at Apple and had lots of grandparents coming in wanting to know how to use the iPad to call up their grandkids that live three hours away. And so they're actually more open to being able to use products. Um, but having that level of simplicity, the accessibility that works hand in hand with usability, um, was, was amazing, and I think that's the direction we have to go in, and it's all around perspective, you know, seeing that as better design, because you're reaching more audiences, you're not just aiming to one, you know, generic standard user, you're considering user-centered um, design, which I think can only benefit um, every one of us. Mm -hmm. There are actually a couple of uh, things that were popular in the accessibility world that became popular in the in the normal world as well, like for example the dark mode, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, w which is really great for it's for accessibility and uh, pretty really much everyone really, yeah. now enjoys the dark mode from time to time. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, situations <coughs> uh, we can think of? Yeah, I mean this is a physical world example. It's not exactly a web example, but I think it's a good one, and it really kind of turned the light bulb on for me when I heard it. And if you've heard it before, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I think it's a good one. Uh, you know, as um, ramps are installed in front of businesses and on street corners, the intention was so that people in wheelchairs could, uh, could access buildings. But who uses ramps? It's not just people in wheelchairs. It's maybe someone pushing a, um, a, a baby carriage or a buggy. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's a delivery person pushing a, a hand truck with some really heavy packages that they don't want to have to carry upstairs. Maybe it's someone who is on crutches temporarily. So there's all sorts of use cases where any of us may find a certain design much more usable. And, and again, it's not just people who have disabilities. Right. Um, I mean, who is actually, who, who should think about accessibility? Uh, that's the next topic we should talk about. Who is contributing to accessibility? And there is uh, an important thing to realize, Molly, can you? 
Can you tell us? Every single one of us. Exactly. <laughs> um, I think one of the big dangers around accessibility, particularly in design, is that it's an add-on, it's an afterthought, it's something that's thought of right at the very end. And I think for whichever role or team you're in, that does mean a lot more work and sometimes a lot more money, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've implemented that right from the get-go in every project or everything you're building, you won't have to worry about it later. And I think it just should become part of that norm. Like who, we're designing stuff for people. <laughs> like let's not forget about the users. Um, so I think when thinking about roles that contribute to accessibility, why shouldn't it be everyone? You know, like if you're an event manager and you're thinking about people coming to your event, why shouldn't you consider accessibility? Um, you know, there could be injuries, you know, temporary injuries, there could be disabilities. That, but that, that's a fine line you don't even need to cross. You just need to think about it, have it on your radar. So I think it's really important that even if you're at the very start of your knowledge journey around accessibility, to at least be thinking about it, to consider um, what more you can do um, to just to create a more accessible experience. I think you made an important point in a friend of mine, Carl Groves. He, it's, it's a couple of years in, in the past, and he did like a research on how, imp how, how, how much costs a bug. And he was ex examining uh, the, like the factor uh, that's contributing to the costs of a bug mm. uh, the later it's been detected in the, mm. in the whole uh, development of a product. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to push the knowledge to the beginning uh, we're talking about left shift yeah, or right shift, shift or whatever. Shift left. Yeah, yeah the shift left. <laughs> right. So where, where do you think, uh, which are the roles that really need to um, um, employ accessibility, Erin? Yeah, I think, uh, at least I've seen a lot of times, um, the initiative starts with the developer. The developer learns about web accessibility, and they, they, they learn that they have an a important role to play in that. Of course, we have to write accessible code. But it absolutely is a team effort. It can't all be on the developer's shoulder. So we can shift left by getting our designers involved. Designers need to learn more about how they can design interfaces that are more accessible. They absolutely need to learn more about color contrast. That's, that's a very important piece. And it's actually really not that hard for them to get in front of and make sure that their colors and their color palette has sufficient contrast. They can test for that. So it doesn't need to get to the developer or the QA tester before we discover that and then have to go back to the designer. So we've got the designer. It comes to the developer. Of course, we need to write code. And we need to know how to test it as we're writing. And then our QA, develop, or QA tester really needs to learn how to test. They need to learn the different uh, assistive technology devices that our users are using. They need to learn the different tools the different approaches, techniques. They need to be coming to our website in all of the ways that our users are. Just like they might test on different browsers, they need to test on multiple screen readers, et cetera. And our product owners, this needs to be part of our definition of done. So it's, it's one of the requirements. It's part of every ticket we work. It's just normal development work. So they need to understand that as well. True. So also, like the project managers and the people making decisions, actually, mm -hmm. because that's what I experience in my, in my work, is that uh, if no one thinks about, if no one's aware about accessibility, it just doesn't happen. Mm. So it's, it's not only a job for the developers, uh, it's like basically everyone involved in a project. So it's, it's really, uh, really important. Um, you mentioned something, Erin, um, which leads us to the next question. Mm -hmm. And uh, we phrased this with tongue in cheek because actually we know that it's not about time. So there's a lot uh, you can do, but basically it's, it's not about having a lot of more money or having a lot of more time. Um, I think you have a strong opinion about that, right? So <laughs> I um, do. Um, I do think it's, it's a misconception that a lot of people have, and I get this question a lot, like, how do I convince my team to, to give me time to do all these things? It's going to cost us more, and we don't have the budget. We don't have the time. We can't meet our deadlines. And so we have to change that perception. Really making sure our applications are accessible is part of development. Just like we need our application to be usable, 
if a user can't use a feature we've developed, that's a bug. We have to fix it. It doesn't matter who our user is. A, a disabled user or a, a temporary limited user should not be given less priority over other types of users. It's all users. It's a bug. We need to fix it. So we need to look at this as just this is part of our normal process. It's not an extra thing that we have to make extra time for. Um, agree that, that there are new skills we have to learn, but that's part of being a, being a person in software development. There are a lot of skills to learn, and we do that all the time. So this is just another one of them. Um, there are a lot of tools that developers can use that can kind of help make their job faster. Um, we can automate some of the test, some of the auditing for issues, sort of the low-hanging fruit. And if we make that part of our normal workflow, that will save us time. It's not going to find all bugs. We still need to make time for manual testing, and our QA, our QA testers can help with that. Uh, another thing I've found that's helped sort of narrow down all of the different tools we need to test is there are uh, surveys available that have looked at you know, what are the top combinations of browser and screen reader usage. Um, and there are really only a few. So we don't have to test every single browser and every single screen reader combination. That would take a really long time. But we can target the most popular ones that most of our users are using and, and kind of narrow that field down. So there are absolutely things we can do to, to save time. But we do need to work on shifting that mindset that the, it's this extra thing we have to now start doing. Yeah, I think it's mostly about the mindset. And one example I always give is like, it costs exactly the same amount of time uh, to choose a color uh, which, which just works and has enough contrast with the colors around uh, as uh, choosing a crappy color. It's exactly the mm -hmm. same time. So it's not about time. It's just about like being aware of things and, and having the correct mindset for that. Do you agree, Molly? Or Absolutely. You <coughs> yes, I think exactly what Erin was saying, and Joshi, just shifting that mentality around, just really embedding it to everything you do and not making it about it being extra time or an extra task. Like, that's where you're thinking about it all wrong. Um, so, so, yeah, literally mm. just everything they just said. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we create, because this is something you should all probably be faced with, how can we create the mindset that's necessary uh, for, uh, because you probably won't change the world as a single person. You probably need the team around you. You need like um, the backing of everyone. So how a can lot, you advocate? A lot of it is education, awareness. As Erin just said, working in this kind of industry, any industry, you should be open-minded to, to learn, like could just keep learning, expanding your own knowledge. I myself, as an accessibility consultant, I'm always trying to learn new things around you know, accessibility in general. I have personal expertise in like the, the sensory impairment side because of my own experiences, but I dedicate a lot of my time and effort into really learning more um, to, in effect, impact, create a bigger impact um, in my day-to-day -day life and work. Um, I think that's really important, really, just to um, listen, go, go online. There's plenty of resources online to, to learn, and there's lots of people like myself with disabilities that are vocal about their experiences and quite happy to work with people as well. Um, just make sure you pay them. Don't, <laughs> don't assume they're just going to come in, you know, free willy and do it for you. Um, you know, appreciate their time as well. Um, but I think it's, it's just really important that you start somewhere. Um, there might be some people there just going, oh, I don't know where to start. Where can I start? But I think just by starting the conversation, talk about it, um, acknowledge your ignorance around it. Like, you know what, I need to learn more about this. Um, and, and do your research, you know, reach out. I'm always on Twitter, <laughs> always happy to answer inquiries and questions. So I'm your first contact along with these two. Um, but there's no reason why, if you haven't started yet, why you can't start now. What do you think, Erin, from, from the view of a developer? How can you, like, imagine you're a developer, you, you're leaving this conference and you say, OK, accessibility is something that sounds quite reasonable. So. How would you approach your colleagues, your, your team, uh, your company, and what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's a good strategy? I think this kind of goes back to the question of why is accessibility important. 
So I think it's understanding what is the why that is going to work for your organization. And so finding what's going to be most important to, to getting their um, backing, getting everyone on board to buy in that this is a top priority for us. So if your organization cares about their users and wants to make sure that they have a good user experience, grab onto that. Use that as your why. Continue to tell your product owners, we really need to work on this because the user experience is not good. We have users that can't do X, Y, Z. So it's important that we spend time to make this user experience better. Uh, if that doesn't work, um, then go back to the bottom line. We have users that can't check out. They can't buy our product because they're being blocked by this feature that doesn't work for them. So we're leaving money on the floor. Um, and then finally, that lawsuit one. If, if, at least if you're in the US, you can always go to the, if we don't make our site accessible, we are, uh, we are legally vulnerable to lawsuits. So I guess that's you know, my trick, is figure out what's going to work for people who are making these decisions and keep pushing that button and help use that when you're having discussions on priority and whether we're going to fix a bug or we're going to spend the time to do whatever. I think the lawsuit thing, unfortunately, doesn't really work that well mm -hmm. in, in Europe so far because we don't have these laws. But there are a couple of simple tricks you can uh, use and try to uh, create empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think creating empathy is a very important mm -hmm. topic at all. But for example, um, you can try and you can even um, recommend to your team just to unplug the mouse or just, just put it away and try to, try to use a piece of software, try to use a website and probably fail after like three seconds or something because it just yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. And uh, trying to create empathy for stuff like that, there are uh, lots of uh, little tricks you can do. We cannot unfortunately elaborate on that right now here, but um, creating awareness is probably uh, the most important first step uh, how you can advocate uh, in your team and in your organization. Um, there are still there are a couple of other things that are kind of because the question, how can we advocate? How can we uh, convince someone to prioritize uh, accessibility? And that's, that's a typical question, and the answer is really hard, actually. But there are a couple of other things you can say. For example, it's just one detail. Basically, everything, uh, every technique that's good for accessibility is also good for search engine optimization. Mm. So you can always use that one uh, if accessibility itself isn't attractive enough. So <laughs> there are a couple of things uh, you can do. Um, the one thing I, I, or at least we thought that would be, it would maybe sound a little bit depressing and it would sound a little bit academic, but we also thought about um, what you actually can do to get uh, into accessibility if you, um, if you don't really know where to start. So um, there are a couple of things we would uh, recommend to do with you, and we also have a little uh, life exercise we would uh, we would uh, play with you, but first of all, uh, what, what, Molly, what would you recommend people to get into accessibility if they are really interested in that? So where, where should they go? So <clears throat> this thing called the internet, I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there's a lot of things, but what I was going to say is that, there, as I mentioned a minute ago, there's a lot of, uh, well, Erin mentioned, there are tools that you can get, sort of automated tools, but I would urge people not to rely on the automated tools. Um, so you've got Site Improve, Wave, those are a couple to name a few. Um, and these are really great because they can run like a mini sort of uh, accessibility audit and it, it, like some of them are more code orientated, some more design facing. Um, and they'll basically flag some errors that are on your website and you can go and check it out right away and do quick fixes. But don't fall on that. My big thing is user testing, usability labs, things like that. Actually get real live users using your website and apps and sit and watch them. Um, it's really interesting because when you get people without disabilities, with disabilities, or older people, or dyslexic users, all using your actual product, that's when you learn most about how usable it is. Not necessarily how accessible it is, but how usable it is. Um, so I would say that's something I'd be really keen for a lot of people to really try and push. Um, get more users involved trialing your products, like keep them involved throughout your process, ask questions, 
etc. Um, so that's something that I would say uh, would be a great thing to uh, look into. Um, social media, is that what we're going to... Social media, we're going to do that with the life exercise. <laughs> Before we come to that, I would like to ask you, Erin, like, from the developer point of view, uh, what are good resources? How can, how can one start with getting acquainted with uh, accessibility? Sure, and, and those tools that, that I touched on and Molly touched on, I'll come back to real quick. I, you know, I found as a developer, uh, I learned the most from running these tools. Be, you know, I knew nothing. I, knew no, I did not know where to start. And it can feel a little overwhelming at first. So these tools will give you these list of bugs. Start there. Each one of those bugs, you can go learn about. How is this impacting accessibility, and how do I fix it? And bit by bit, you'll learn about those things. From there, you can start to, to learn more online. There are a ton of great resources out there. There are some really good checklists. Um, some of you may have heard of the WCAG or WCAG guidelines. That's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. This is a whole list of things our web applications, our websites should do to be accessible. And so there are checklists out there that help you with that to make sure you're doing all of the things. So starting with those checklists can give you each, each thing to go research, each thing to go learn more about and learn how to do. And bit by bit, your, your knowledge grows, and you have learned how to do these things. So that, that's how I would approach it. Can I add a point as well? Um, <clears throat> who here has an iPhone or Android? That's got to be everyone, right? Hands up, hands? Yeah? Cool. So are you aware of accessibility features on your phone and where they are? Nice and loud, please. She's deaf, so I <laughs> <laughs> can't hear you. Um, great. So did you know on either one of them, you can actually create accessibility shortcuts? So you can tap in and out of, say, like a screen reading tool. So if you're on Facebook or you're on whatever, and you think, I wonder how well VoiceOver works on this app, you can triple tap, tap into your shortcut, and then tap out. Because um, that's one of the things that people really freak out about using screen readers. They're like, oh my goodness, how do I turn it off? So I would definitely look into your Android or iOS accessibility shortcut and recommend you do that using your own device when you've got some free time or when you want to do some testing, because um, that is one way of creating some kind of empathy yeah. um, from a user perspective. Um, but yes, yeah. <laughs> That was basically, but that was perfect. And uh, <laughs> while you are already uh, like having your smartphone in your hand, we prepared a little um, uh, life exercise. I'm not sure who of you knows what alternative texts are. Okay, quite a few, uh, but I think we need to uh, explain in a couple of sentences, Erin. Do you want to explain what? Sure. So if a, a screen reader or other assistive technology device comes across an image. It needs a way to describe that image out loud to, to someone who can't see the image. And so if, if we don't code our image tags to have an alt attribute, then sometimes that screen reader might default to reading the file name. And we know how awful our file names typically are. So by, by filling in that alt attribute, we can actually describe the image to something that's much more useful to the user. Exactly. And uh, who of you knows that when you, who of you uses Twitter or Instagram? Okay, so quite a few people. Um, Twitter and Instagram both, and probably all, all the other platforms as well, Twitter and Instagram both uh, ha give you the choice to add an alternative text to your images so that people who are sight impaired, maybe Molly or other blind people, uh, are, are really can really understand and can fully uh, get your images. Um, so we would like to teach you how to do this because this is really, really easy. Uh, that's why we decided, actually we decided yesterday, so it's a crappy little <laughs> website I put up this morning. Um, and I created a little website, you find the URL up there, and hopefully you can uh, can scan this uh, QR code as well. And then we, uh, in case you don't know how to uh, add the alternative text to your images, then there is a little description up there. Um, so basically, uh, what the life exercise actually is, we would like you to take a, an image now or maybe later um, <laughs> and add uh, alternative text to that so that everyone uh, can actually see or read the image 
Um, you're free to mention us. I'm going to switch to the first slide. Uh, there are our Twitter handles, and I think Molly's is the same on, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, so please um, mention us and let us know. And hopefully you're doing this um, all the time from now on, because this is really important as a small step. It's a really small step to describe your images, uh, not only when you create websites and stuff, but you can also do it with social media. And that, that, that would be really nice. Mm -hmm. By the way, on the site uh, we created there, I'm going to switch back to the QR code. Um, our handles are on the website as well. Um, we also compile a little list of, of resources on our website with uh, like communities you can connect to, uh, Slack communities. Or uh, Aaron mentioned a couple of checklists that are really handy. Um, you can use them. And you've, you'll find a couple of links there which are a good start into the mm -hmm. web accessibility topic. So actually, that's it. We've got five minutes left. Um, it was a lot of, a lot of talking. Um, time's almost over, but we would like to encourage you to uh, throw your questions at us if you, if you have got any.